And we're going to pick up where Ben Hodges left off and we're going to start talking about escalation management, which seems to be a feature of this war, at least amongst some of the allies that are supposedly supporting Ukraine, but not giving Ukraine everything it needs to win. We're going to look at this strategy, what it's founded on, what is restraining the actions of the allies, and how Russian propaganda is potentially manipulating, coercing the allies into not doing what they should. It's an element of fear, there's nuclear terrorism, but we also have to examine what is Putin prepared to do, what is he not prepared to do? Does he in fact have any red lines at all? Sergei, it's great to have this conversation. Uh, it's great to be in Berlin to talk about this. And of course, Germany is one of those countries where it gets a lot of bashing because of tourists and certain systems that aren't supplied. But at the same time, Germany, Germany has come on a, an incredible journey over the last two years from initially providing a handful of helmets to now providing some serious uh, hardware and, of course, a very, very large, in volume terms, amount of military support. Well, first, um, where to talk about it? Uh, not in Berlin. Berlin is a symbol, a quintessence of Russian attempts to intimidate, to distract, to distort, to disinform and to subjugate Europe and um, Russian agents, uh, maybe only in Vienna, feel as good as they do in Berlin. Um, and I don't agree that it is Germany bashing, it's more Germany encouraging. We already discussed on the later uh, panel with um, Aaron, uh, with Aaron Bernard that um, after this war has been unleashed, the full-scale war, of course, the war started uh, 10 years ago, but the full-scale invasion has been unleashed by Russia, by Vladimir Putin himself, uh, a lot of countries in the central part of Europe, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Ukraine, told Germany, said to Germany, send your tanks. Uh, a Polish uh, foreign minister said that uh, the only thing he is afraid more than uh, a strong German army is a weak German army. The Ukrainians who had uh, a terrible experience with German army on their soil, because like our army, Wehrmacht and SS, have killed millions of Ukrainians. 16% of Ukrainian population have been killed during uh, World War II. The whole territory of Ukraine has been occupied. Uh, like hundreds of uh, towns completely destroyed. The largest massacre on Jews uh, in a single town took place in Kyiv in two days uh, in uh, October uh, 1941. Over 30,000 of Kyiv Jews have been killed. The, the largest destruction of uh, the largest destruction of one city in, uh, in the history of World War II by, uh, by uh, like, uh, soldiers took, in Ukraine, took place in Ukraine, and, and, and. and these people told to, to German Chancellor, send the tanks. Send, we want German tanks see rolling towards our, our, our countries because uh, we want us to be protected. And I remember how uh, the Ukrainian Jews, uh, Association of Jewish Communities in Ukraine, published an open letter to Olaf Scholz uh, a couple of weeks before the full-scale invasion, and they urged the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, they said, we are the uh, grandsons and granddaughters of those Jews who survived the Holocaust, and we are afraid that we will be killed now in this war. And some of them were killed. And we ask you, German Chancellor, to send arms to Ukraine. Please do not let us be killed. And you know what? German Chancellor has never answered. And that was the terrifying, absolutely terrifying sign of how Germany did not understand what is going on. So, of course, as you said, a lot of progress has been done. And Germany has no problem now with sending um, artillery, tanks, or missiles, like air defense missiles, is the best uh, compromise. Because it doesn't kill Russian soldiers, but it protects Ukrainian lives. But we still have a lot of problem with sending missiles which can change the, uh, change the situation in this war and bring Russian troops, which are still outnumber the Ukrainians, uh, bring the Russian troops in the situation where they cannot bring reserves. Because as you know, the best thing when you hit your enemy is not when the enemy has arrived at the front line and uh, uh, constructed all defensive lines and is in trenches, but when this enemy is on the train or in the road, that is when you need to hit. And that is what Germany is still, okay, German Chancellor, not Germany, he's quite a different man, 
uh, has not understand or understands but is not willing to do. That's why no bashing but encouraging. Let's deconstruct some of the, not just Russian narratives, because that does play a part, let's deconstruct some of the reasons of why there is reluctance. And this isn't just Berlin. There is, I think, deep reluctance in Washington to give Ukraine everything it needs, um, not just to uh, hold the line. I think, I think there's a, a, a common agreement that holding the line uh, is, is a good thing, um, but to actually retake territory. I think there's a, a reluctance to do that. One, of course, one can say is the fear of escalation. And this is one we need to unpack. And this is really down to fear. This is where Russian narratives are really playing and working, especially the nuclear fear. And we need to unpack that one because I think that that is especially taken seriously in Washington and Berlin, the two capitals that really you know, pay attention to that. For some reason in Britain and, and, and possibly France, I'm not so sure about France, but in Britain we seem to be a little less concerned. We see that as a kind of terroristic threat, which we're not going to be intimidated by. But let's unpack, because I think it's more significant what Berlin and Washington believe. Then you have, and it's the elephant in the room, there's business interests. There is potentially a hope that business will return to normal and that the companies that are either left or are semi-operating or fully operating in Russia will be able to resume their operations and here we go, let's, let's carry on making money. That has to be uh, analysed there. And then you've just touched upon the third one, which is some misplaced war guilt, but also perhaps a misplaced sense that Putin is the main problem, that Russia is a, you know, Russia is a, a, a deeply humanist country, uh, there are good Russians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and that if only we can give them a chance, th their behaviour will change. If they could just get rid of Putin, everything would be fine. Ukrainians have obviously a very different point of view on this. Uh, I'd love to know your point of view. Are these the three main blockers to us supporting Ukraine? Are there other things we need to be considering as well? Well, you have um, touched a lot of topics and uh, we can... I'm happy that we have this eight hours marathon and we can uh, dive deeper in every discussion because it, it really it needs to be discussed in a very academic, if you want, manner with a lot of details and nuances. Um, I would say that, uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, dream in Germany of uh, greater Russia, better Russia, uh, sacred Russia. Um, for many generations of the Germans, there was no such country uh, as Ukraine or, I don't know, Belarus or other, uh, other nations because it was all Russian Empire. And if you look into the, um, into the um, uh, albums uh, with uh, photographs, which the German soldiers and German army was most equipped with uh, portable cameras, photo cameras, that's why we know that much about uh, German war crimes because they, they, they made pictures of every war crime they did because they were proud of doing that. And uh, when they... Uh, Not so different from now. I mean, a lot of the Russian war criminals are being uh, found because they're posting on social media. Absolutely, they're... and that is, uh, that is what we see in, in parallels. We see that Putin uses, uh, to a large extent, rhetorics of Adolf Hitler with the Lebensraum, with the um, gathering ethnic nationals, with denying right of countries to exist because they allegedly threaten Russia and 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 all these talks about world plutocracy and Washington and they even uh, touch the topic of anti-semitism they attacked Zelensky President Zelensky of Ukraine clearly with anti-semitic rhetoric and we know they can touch it later but uh, what is important is that the German soldiers who were in Ukraine during the World War II they normally read that they are in Russia and if we read for example the the diaries of uh, Heinrich Böll, who turned into a pacifist and Nobel Prize uh, winner, uh, but that time he was a German soldier, and when he was traveling from uh, Chernobyl to Vinnytsia in Ukraine, he uh, read with huge letters in his diary, Russia, and uh, he put five or six exclamation signs. So for them it was Russia, and uh, the guilt is towards Russia. So, and Ukrainians, who are Ukrainians? Yeah, they are maybe collaborationists, like pro-Nazis, and that fit perfectly into the Russian narrative. So now I want to touch another thing. Because there is no aggression caused by Russia which has not been prepared equivocally very, in a very sustainable and well-elaborated way for months, if not years. 
the Russians, before they attack a country, the Russians try to demoralize the possible, uh, not only the, the, the potential victim, but most and foremost, the potential allies. They try to explain that A, the victim is uh, a danger for Russia. It's a NATO expansion or um, like uh, some anti-Russian Russophobic policy. We don't want to do it, but the Russians are being oppressed there, Russian language, Russian schools, you name it. Then they want to demonstrate that this country is actually a Nazi country. And the Russians tested it with the Baltic countries already in 27, 28, and all the Balts were Nazis. The Ukrainians are Nazis, all the Nazis. Uh, Zelensky is the Obel Nazi, and uh, that is what they say. But then they try to explain the resistance is meaningless, like it will not help you. We are so strong, that's why all these propaganda uh, videos about the might of the Russian army, you know now it's not true. I actually, I ask myself if the might of the Chinese army of the same quality, because we don't know, like the Russians, they had wars without stop. Uh, Transnistria, Georgia 93, Chechnya 94, 2000, Syria, Ukraine 2014. Like they have the whole generation of officers who are fighting and they are still incapable. Russian army didn't fight a war, but that is just a side topic. There's but the famous incident, isn't there? Where uh, US special forces in Syria came up against a, a battalion of Wagnerites uh, and the Russian high command disowned them and said, no, we have no one in the field. And then uh, the US soldiers proceeded to absolutely obliterate them with no equipment and troop losses on the US side. Exactly, that is what happens when uh, the Russian army meets real army if it is the US army or the Ukrainian army. Like they just got obliterated if uh, um, the, uh, uh, the opponent has enough weapons. Like the Ukrainians with 20 HIMARS, uh, the West provided them, they have stopped the Russian uh, offensive and started a counteroffensive. But uh, if we talk about the pre-war situation, the Russians target our elites and try to spread fears, discord and false hopes. Fears about escalation and consequences, uh, discord, uh, smearing the potential victim, and false hope that you may sign a deal with Russia. That this is not about the whole Ukraine. This is only about Crimea. And Crimea is not that Ukraine, it's Russia, and it's not about Donbass, it's only about parts of Donbass, and we can sign a deal. It's not about the whole Ukraine, it's only Kyiv. It's not about uh, NATO, it's only about Ukraine. And they are using this salami tactic, slicing, uh, the, the, uh, uh, slicing the, the victim, so the potential allies think, okay, should we risk a nuclear escalation for Luhansk? Do you know where is Luhansk? Have you ever been there? Why, why risking nuclear bombs falling in, uh, on Berlin or London? Well, we can just agree that Putin takes that and he's happy. He's not happy. He's never happy. And that is the topic of nuclear escalation. I'm really happy you touched the topic because uh, later in our program, I just revealed the secret. We have a special interview on that, uh, German fear and nuclear escalation. But they know that we, especially in Germany, we are absolutely afraid of that. The whole German anti-NATO and anti-US movement in 1970s, deeply infiltrated by Russian KGB agents, deeply used as assets like absolutely used and infiltrated. But it was based on the idea, uh, better red than dead. We can accept to be slaves, but we don't want to be grilled. And that brings to the idea, yeah, and who is interested in fighting Russia? Who will be a winner? Maybe the US Americans, they will fight a war on German territory. So we just ask them politely to remove their nukes and they will be neutral and Russia will not attack. No, exactly in that moment, Russia attacks. Because now I wrap up, Ukraine in 2014, when Russia attacked, was the most pro-Russian country among all in Central Europe. 94% uh, of Ukrainians said that they positively look on Russia. Only 2% say that they think that Russia is an enemy state. Now it's quite the opposite. Ukraine, uh, definitely was against NATO membership. Now it's the opposite. And Ukrainian constitution was a ban on any 
foreign troops stationed on Ukrainian territory, with one exception, Russian troops in Crimea. So if we look at the legal and public legal state and public opinion, Russia would say, why to attack? Like this country is practically our best ally. But the Russians promote because they were hungry. They wanted to get more. And they started to promote narrative about danger from Ukraine, uh, occupation of Russian lands, uh, oppression of Russian speaking population. And the West bought this. But Russians use it all the time. They use it in 1920s against Poland, in 1940s against the Baltic countries, in uh, 1996 against Chechnya, and now they use it against Ukraine. And Finland, we remember. And this is an interesting example because, of course, um, depends who you speak to. Finland either lost its war against Russia or, or, it, or it won. I mean, uh, and, and people will say, well, obviously it lost a lot of land. It lost its third largest city. The Karelia uh, Peninsula was lost. It was a fantastic area of uh, ecological beauty. Russia gained a lot. But at the same time, Finland was able to demonstrate that you're going to get punched in the face. You come here, we're, we're not going to just sort of let you get away with this. You're going to be punched in the face and you're going to get a bleeding nose. And Stalin accepted that. And that, that, that idea that your adversary can hit you back with force um, seems to be the only thing that, um, this is going to sound crude, that the, the Russia understands. It understands the power of force and then it will negotiate. It, it will try to exact a high price, but it will negotiate with you as a genuine partner rather than trying to bypass you. And at the moment, it's clearly trying to bypass Ukraine. It doesn't want to be seen to be negotiating with it because it does not want to consider it as an entity with agency. It sees potentially, it genuinely sees Ukraine as a US puppet. In fact, it may well see all European countries as a puppet of the US. We're in Berlin and it sort of struck me as we crossed the city this morning, why did Russia not carry on advancing after the Second World War? And that's because we show determination not to let West Berlin fall to Russian threats. Once they realized that we had the will, determination, and the force to back it up, they accepted that reality and then moved on to try and fight somewhere else. Do you see an analogy in this? Because this talks very much to this idea of escalation management. Uh, history tends to show that actually it's more about projecting your will, projecting force and creating a physical barrier to Russian aggression. That's the only thing that works. The aggression doesn't stop. It just tries to find a weak area rather than the strength you've projected. Absolutely, and what you uh, mentioned with Finland, it's a classic like porcupine tactic, like you cannot win a fight against a tiger, but you may grow so much needles that it will at a certain moment stop trying to attack you because like he's full of the, his face is uh, full and his uh, tongue is full of uh, your needles and you also get scared and you get probably can get even injured, but you survive. And uh, that is the only thing that Russia um, understands since uh, decades when um, the opponent fights back and Russia uh, tries either to find other tactics. If they don't work, they just look for the next weak opponent. It is what Lenin uh, wrote, um, and it, from this point of view, I, I, I urge everyone to read Lenin because he exposed the whole nature of Russian foreign policy. He was the, the creator of it to a certain extent. He said, we shall check their readiness with bayonets. If the bayonets hits the steel, we retreat. If the bayonets hits the, 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 uh, the grass, we advance. Mm -hmm. And that is what they did with Poland. They got hit in Poland. Uh, they, they disappeared in like 1920. They disappeared for like almost 20 years. There was no Russian attacks on Poland. Of course, after that, when they agreed with uh, Hitler and when there was the, this Russia, Nazi Germany pact, and they combined uh, jointly attack uh, Poland. Uh, it was quite another situation, but they grew up muscles and they found other dictatorships as alliances. That is their tactics. And we need to understand that um, the, the Western approach to Russia, and when we, as we in Berlin, we talk about the German approach, it was this uh, Wandel durch Handel, change through trade. And the basic idea was that nations which have trade, they got closer, they have contacts, they understand each other better, they don't attack. And the change really happened, but not on the side of Russia as we hoped. 
the change happened here in Germany. And that is understandable, because when you have your business active in a dictatorship, you are a democracy and you are dependent on what your people think about you. And if your businesses who have their interest, and not everyone is interested in politics, they say, okay, we can earn like 5%, 15% a year uh, if we have good relations, but if we have bad relations, we maybe not earn anything and even have losses. So I will pressure my government to have good relations with that guy. I don't care about democracy. I don't care about strategic peace, etc. I want my money. And, in, uh, and your government accepts that uh, because they have elections. But in Russia, in a dictatorship, and we do now the same mistake with China. In a dictatorship, they can order their businesses to keep quiet. They can tell them, okay, you have losses. It's what your job is to have. I am a sovereign. I am a monarch. I run the business. And if I want all of your property to fund it, I will take it. And you just shut up. And that is what Russia did. They, of course, the economy is fallen. Of course, the whole... Industries are being destructed. Their planes cannot fly. Their uh, citizens get so much overcredited now because they cannot pay their debts. But it's calm in the country because it's a dictatorship. And we believe that if we buy Russian gas, Russia is as interested in, in our money as we in their gas. No, they used it as a weapon. They just cut the delivery of gas and they destroyed their own pipeline just to provoke unrest here in Germany. For Putin, like a couple of billion euro was not interesting enough compared to political destruction of Germany. And they hope that we have here public unrest, burning streets, scores, like maybe if like some ethnic riots appear, it's even better because you can broadcast it on the whole world and say, look, the German society is falling, Russia is a bastion of stability. And that is what the German politicians never understood. They believe that Putin is a child, a person like a department chief from a provincial city. Yes, he was once in Petersburg, but he's much more than that. He's a ruthless criminal, manipulator and psychopath. And this exposes, I think, some, some fundamental misconceptions uh, about how Russia operates and a fundamental view of the world. So we're projecting onto them the idea that they are as economically rational as we are. And I see this a lot in some of the arguments people make about why Russia invaded Ukraine in the first place. And people still insist, ah, oh, this is all about resources. The US is only interested because there's gas deposits, mineral deposits, blah, blah, blah. Russia's only really interested because, and then they list all the wealth and assets that Ukraine has that Russia uh, can take, ignoring the idea that Russia is purposefully destroying the entire industrial base. It has got a scorched earth policy. It, it doesn't care if anything's left standing. It doesn't seem to care if the territory is economically productive or workable. And this is going to be controversial. When Germany took territories in the Second World War, they did not raise everything to the ground unless there was strong resistance. And we know in Warsaw they did eventually, but generally they wanted to try and keep the industrial base intact because they wanted to use it. They wanted to extract wealth from it to power their war machine. Russia doesn't seem to work on the same economic rationality, but we act as if they do. Well, um, I would not agree here with you. I'd say the Russians do the same. Um, they also extremely interested in making their wars profitable. Or well, just look during the first eight years of uh, Russia-Ukraine war, uh, the Russians dismantled and deported to Russia almost every single factory in Donbas, and they even made uh, TV stories on state TV about that, how they evacuate the factories. By the way, they exactly the same way they made protocols of their crimes on deportation of Ukrainian children and Putin himself delivered a testimony on TV talking to Maria Lvova Belova, his chief kidnapper. Uh, and Putin gave her an order to kidnap Ukrainian children and deport them. That's why Putin got a warrant, uh, an arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court. But uh, back to the economy, uh, of course they try to exploit territories, of course they, they, they want to steal everything. They uh, have stolen uh, every piece of cultural heritage of Ukraine, uh, from Mariupol, the whole museum of uh, painters, world-class painters like Kuinji, was just 
uh, brought to Moscow and Petersburg to Hermitage. And I, I really cannot understand how uh, European museums still can cooperate with Hermitage, saying culture is uh, above the politics. No, it's like you are cooperate with a Nazi a museum director who just uh, taken all the Jewish property or Polish property, etc. No, he's a war criminal. And exactly the Russians tried to get access to Crimean a gold, which was an exhibition in the Netherlands, a Scythian gold, and uh, thanks God, after two years of, of uh, court uh, process, of court uh, decision was that this uh, gold must return not to Crimea occupied by Russia, but to uh, Ukrainian territory. Uh, so they try to do it, but what you write, absolutely, and I cannot repeat it enough, are uh, the Russians have another economic rationality than we. They are ready, because they think in the uh, concept of value of violence and ability to cause pain, because they think that only ability to cause you pain and in, on the maximum, the top, to kill you, painfully, uh, is the best way to control you. So that's why they are willing to play even a negative sum game than zero sum game or positive sum game when they see that their opponent suffers more. Um, so a German politician would say, okay, I can have an outcome like you get uh, 10 euro after this round and I get like 2 euro and another outcome is you get like zero, I uh, get one, then maybe it's better for me to get two because two is better than one. So I will be in the first uh, outcome, I will have less money than you, but in the second outcome I will have more money than you, but I will have less money than they could have got. The Russians say, in the first outcome, I suffer minus one, you suffer minus two. In the second outcome, I suffer minus ten, but you suffer minus hundred. I take the second one. Because it will make you so weak that next turn I come and just take all what you have. And that is what they do. Of course, they wanted to occupy Ukraine within three days. Of course, they wanted to fully integrate the Ukrainian economy. And they they need Ukrainian technologies, they need Ukrainian missile production, uh, rocket engine production, helicopters production. Remember how they, they tried to, to put, and Chinese tried also to put under control the Zaporizhia uh, helicopter engine plant. Uh, of course they need it all. Ukraine has a lot of population, and Russians wanted to re-educate them and use them as cannon fodder. But as soon as they see we cannot take it, we better destroy it, they say because it doesn't, it may not get into hands of the enemy. And enemy is everyone who is not Russia. And you now we see them, uh, coming back to your point earlier, they label everyone as Nazis who shows any willingness to resist. To an extent, have they also, well, they clearly miscalculated on the reaction of the Ukrainian people as a whole. They miscalculated uh, what the people in the so-called Russian-speaking areas would react. They expected to be embraced, uh, to have people coming out on the streets and welcome them. None of that happened in any areas really where they occupied. Um, didn't their perception potentially go from seeing um, some Ukrainians as potential material they could work with to increasingly seeing Ukrainians as something to be feared and destroyed. And we, we start to see that behavior in Irpin, Butcher and others. It seems to go beyond just the envy uh, and cruelty of individual soldiers to a realization that, that we're never going to control these people. We're never going to control this land. It's going to cause us endless pain. We kind of miscalculated, right, well, let's just, let's just destroy anybody who uh, is going to be resisting us. Well, um, once again, excellent question. And the of course, uh, the Ukrainian society has demonstrated incredible level of resistance. And uh, from this perspective, I can only repeat uh, the popular saying of a Ukrainian soldier. Uh, it's, uh, like, it's very good for us. We're lucky that the Russians are so stupid. Uh, so the Russians said that they, 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 they went, uh, the first days, they went into Ukraine with, without any proper protection, uh, with all the columns of trucks, uh, without armor. Uh, they, they, they brought a musical orchestra with them because they believed that in two days there will be a celebration on Kreshatik in Kyiv. Uh, they, they brought tanks uh, without camouflage but in a parade with parade stickers with the St. Georg's band. 
Plus, they, they, they thought we just, okay, we go this 100 kilometer, uh, everyone salutes us, and, and we have taken the city. They even called the, the Kiev restaurants in front of that, and they have been that call. They, they called Kiev restaurants to book uh, tables in a restaurant for celebration. Um, and that didn't happen. But do not underestimate the ability of cruel dictatorships and of totalitarian societies. And Russia is a totalitarian society, it's not a dictatorship, it's a totalitarian society. The abilities of these societies to digest and absorb people. If you take, they, they, they have all the means for that. There is in the West the idea that uh, a guerrilla war cannot be won because you cannot fight the population. Of course you cannot fight the population if you're a democracy. Like you burn like several villages and uh, it causes that much damage to your credibility that, and for right, you just arrest the soldiers, you put them to, you court martial them, and the, 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 your public opinion says just go away of that. But dictatorships, they don't have that problem. And if you give them enough time, they will digest any nation. They will torture them. They will kill deliberately people who, who resist or who think differently. They will re-educate children. They will take children from family and, and, and. And don't forget, despite all the resistance which existed in Ukrainian society up to 1990s against the Soviet occupation, most of Ukrainians were integrated into the Soviet army, into the Soviet structures. Of course, they were not happy. They were not the best Soviets. But the Soviets used them to occupy Afghanistan, to occupy Czechoslovakia, to do other things. And Russia wants to have it. That's why they kidnap children, they bring them to the military camp, and they re-educate them, because they know that on the long run, you have one generation, you have two generations, and you win, because you're cruel, you're reckless. And that is what they did in Chechnya, in each carrier. Chechnya, each carrier, won the first war against Moscow with incredible costs and without any Western support, only with light arms, with firearms and RPGs. But then Russians regained. They signed even the peace treaty with Masada. They promised autonomy. In two years, they violated it. They entered again with new army, with new troops, highly motivated troops. They occupied the country. They imposed incredible level of violence with organized rape, with organized kidnapping, with organized torture, with execution of the whole families, and, and, and. And now what we see, some Chechens in exile are against Kadyrov, some are for Kadyrov, and many Chechens are fighting in Ukraine for Putin. You can re-educate people, even the bravest one, and dictatorships want to re-educate the bravest and the cleverest and the most clever ones, because they know they need capable soldiers. And the best soldiers in the Soviet army were Ukrainian soldiers. And that's what Putin wants. That is the resource he wants to get. And we forget that this strategy has been tried over and over and over again. Uh, Hungary wasn't just beaten by uh, Russian troops. They used the uh, other countries' populations against it. Even more so in Czechoslovakia in 1968, uh, it was attacked by the combined forces of the Warsaw Pact. Again, not just Russian soldiers. So this is a tactic that has worked for Russia over and over again. Absolutely. And look, when um, I, I, I really like, I, I, I really sick and tired listening in Germany to some guys, sometimes girls, who are, who think that they are over smart. Mm -hmm. And they think, look, we have a creative idea. Like the moment when, when a German politician do, does know, does not understand what is going around, he comes up with a creative idea. And it says, why don't we just like sign some sort of treaty with Russia? And once again, it's very good to trade what is not yours. Sign some treaty with Russia. We accept this um, front line, it's frozen. And we don't recognize the sovereignty of Russia over that regions, which Russia occupies, uh, as we did with the Baltic states in 1940. But then we'll pump a lot of money into Ukraine and the people on the occupied territories will see that uh, Ukraine is flourishing and one day in two generations they will join it like Germany united. Like Germany 1990, fall of the Berlin Wall, close to the studio, and we'll be happy. Okay, uh, nothing can demonstrate the arrogance and the ignorance of the German politicians more than that. First, 
they ignore the reason why Germany was portioned. Like there was some tiny little thing like World War II and genocide and death camps and, and uh, everything. So Germany was portioned actually as a result of World War II, as a, partly as a punishment, partly as a guarantee that there will be no war anymore from German land. That's why Germany was occupied. Like, what did Ukraine do to, to let Ukraine be occupied? But the second thing is, okay, like, putting aside the uh, topic of guilt, is it realistic to keep peace with that sort of deal? No. First, there is no guarantee that Putin will not start the war in two years, when he gets more missiles from Iran, from North Korea, maybe from China. He builds new tanks, he conscripts new people, he trains new troops, he buys more European politicians, he organized some, some sabotage acts in, uh, in Ukraine, and here he comes again. And what will happen to the population? Despite all the cru cruelty of the Soviet regime on the Eastern German territory, and despite all the cruelty of the communist regime in the GDR, there was no plan of the Soviets, even under Stalin, to genocidally erase the German nation. They wanted to re-educate them, they wanted to have us as um, loyal citizens of that country, as slaves, as vassals, you name it, but they didn't want to eradicate us. They didn't want us to be Russians. And the Russians want Ukrainians to cease to exist. So you practically punish Ukraine in this plan for what Ukraine has never done and without any feasible, realistic perspective of stable peace. So maybe you just like go back to your uh, Hamburg tax office where Scholz belongs, and it didn't went well, we know it, uh, and, and, and stop talking about world politics because you clearly don't understand. But of course, the German politician always knows how to fix any country in the world. And let's take a step back because there is this unfortunate assumption that seems to be built into a lot of the calculus uh, in many Western countries that first Putin will be satisfied with Crimea, then he'll be satisfied with Donbass. Okay, maybe he's not satisfied with those. He'll be satisfied with Ukraine as a whole. That's the limit of his ambitions. And what we're essentially placing on is not just the limit on his ambitions, but a limit on the methods he's prepared to use, the escalatory ladder he's prepared to go on to achieve his aims. And this is where it gets a little bit speculative, but we see absolute chaos in the Middle East. Now, whether Russia is or isn't behind it, whether they knew the date, the time, the scale or not, is highly debatable. What is not is that the world's focus on the Middle East, on the chaos happening there, and now the Houthis, um, uh, sabotaging you know trade routes and so on what's quite clear is that benefits Russia because it takes the focus off Ukraine and it takes the focus on what their Wagnerite forces are doing in Africa and the many other arenas around the world where Russia is quite clearly directly trying to sow chaos or where chaos is beneficial to Moscow's interests well, I, I agree with you again, and of course, uh, that is the part of Russia's strategy. They want you to believe, as a Western politician, that the, there is something terrible in the room which can happen, what can happen. And you can prevent it by accepting a much lesser evil, and even evil on costs of a country which is not a real one and which is a bad one, a Nazi country, bad, corrupt, Nazi country. And that's actually another one narrative the Russians spread about Ukraine, the corruption. Like those people who purchased our chancellor, uh, who purchased uh, Austrian foreign minister, French foreign minister, they are talking about corruption in Ukraine. So the Russians come with a more or less a proposition to you. And it comes, they, they combine their force because it's dictatorship. They um, come in a coordinated way. But you as a democracy think that it is just a public opinion because the academ academia comes to you, foreign minister comes to you, uh, their experts come to you, your businessmen come to you. And they all say, you. They, uh, you have actually two choices. Um, you can face a global war, 
or you can accept that Russia takes a tiny little part of a country which you don't even know where it is, and it will be over. And then it goes further and further and further, of course. And that is a trick which actually every street criminal knows. Every street criminal knows. There are like two ways of street criminals attacking. First one, they need to create a pretext for attack. Like they, they come across the, uh, like uh, in, in front of you and provoke some collision. And then they start to attack you, like blaming you for the collision. As a polite man, you try to explain, no, I didn't want to do it, sorry. But they don't need your apologies. They need to create the situation when you are already in a weak position. And then they rob you or they maybe steal something from you because while you're arguing with them, a complete steals your money back. But it is a faked escalation. They want, they want to, they know they want to escalate and they know you will try to find a compromise, but they're not interested in compromise. But they're also testing you. Because if at that point you don't apologize, Absolutely. but you say, what the hell are you doing? Get out of my face. That for them is a signal. Then they disappear. Then they disappear. Yeah. And the, the, the second strategy is typical for fraudsters. They never start with you a talk with like, transfer me $1 million today to an, like some account. No, they say, we have a great deal and you can get like five million or I have a great uh, delivery of goods, but I need like to pay a fee and could you transfer me like 200 euro, 300 euro? And they say, oh, sorry, there is like another delay, like the custom officers needs to be bribed and could you transfer me like another 500 euro? And say, wow, like the, the profit is that big and I have already sent like 300 euro. What makes a difference if I send another 50 euro, 200 euro? It makes no difference. And at the end you see it uh, on a deal which never was intended to be, you have paid like 5,000 or 20,000 euro bills. And we know a case when people paid millions like that, millions, and you get nothing. Because it is the fallacy of sunk costs, because you know I have already invested that much and I will invest one more. And that is what Putin is doing. He is saying uh, to us, look, uh, the uh, Dilemma is very simple. A little bit of Ukraine or a huge thermonuclear war. What do you choose? But it's a false, it's a false choice. And you need to answer him, you know what I choose? I choose delivery of terrorist missiles to Ukraine and every single year oil refinery is being hit. And then we look what happens next. And we're not playing, we're not playing their game. Um, you know, um, they'll do these things. I got a faulty earpiece there. I'm just going to let that fall down here. Um, so we also have to do things in the open. We have to be seen as democracies and sometimes we overshare what we're about to do uh, and what we intend to do, what we don't intend to do. We've seen Biden right from the start of this war sort of spelling out what they're not going to do but not spelling out what they are going to do. The only exception to that of course was to send a uh, attack them, limited quantity, but send them and not say anything about it. Give them a chance to kind of work. Now, if we were going to tackle the propagandistic threats, we would adopt some of their techniques, which is to say maybe, no, we're not going to do this, but then do it anyway, and just create that uncertainty on their side about what we will and what we won't do. But we have this extraordinary transparency for some reason, we think that's how you should work on the international stage. In some ways, we are still positioning, or ask you the question as a question, are we still positioning Russia and thinking of it as a country that operates, you know, foreign policy diplomacy in the way that it's operated and international relations in the way it's operated in the West. And yet what we're dealing with is a gopnik, to use wow. your phrase. Um, look, let me put it that way. Uh, when Russia, and I come back to my, to my favorite topic, when Russia starts to uh, prepare to the next war, they want to delegitimize de de the opponent. And that's why all the Putin's um, saying about like Ukraine is not a country, it never existed, Lenin created it, uh, like the, the territory is not legally uh, realistic. Um, then he created the narrative that the uh, Ukrainian state doesn't exist anymore because Yanukovych left the country and that means that the Ukrainian statehood is not existent anymore. That means that no treaty with Ukraine um, uh, needs to be respected and, and, and. So they try to create some false discussions with false narratives 
are trying to put them in a quasi-legalistic way. So we start saying, oh, interesting, what was the year Ukraine was created? Oh, does, it, does it say that uh, Ukraine may be attacked by an older country? What says Professor uh, this one and Professor this one? Let's make a TV show about it. At the same time, the Russians, they create um, a mythology of own greatness and own ancient character. And from this perspective, everything what happened somehow being related to Moscow or Petersburg is being called Russia. Ukrainian artists who created their art during the Soviet occupation or Tsarist occupation, they are Russian artists. But Ukrainian nationalists who allegedly cooperated with Hitler are of course Ukrainian. And then Russia says, yeah, we have like 1,000 years of history. Now, the superior, the supreme Council of the Soviet Union stated in their document on 31st December 1990 that the Soviet Union as a subject of international law has ceased to exist. Not transited to Russian Federation, ceased to exist. And Russian Federation was proclaimed as a new state, new entity. Yes, they claim that they have all the rights of the Soviet Union, but it's not the same legal entity. Only um, after that. Now they say, no, it was all the Russian history with the Tsars, with Katharina II, with Peter I, and even further to Kiev at times, like before Moscow was founded, and like the word Russia was invented in 17 something by Peter I as he uh, used the Greek term. Ignoring that Novgorod was a separate republic. Yeah, it was a republic, it, 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 it not was, even a monarchy. It was at that Hanseatic time, yes. state, Hanseatic. <laughs> together with uh, Gdansk, together with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Szczecin, together with, uh, with Hamburg and Bremen. So then they say, yeah, like uh, Moscow was founded in uh, 1147, but Kiev, uh, which had adopted Christianity on the whole country in uh, 988, it is still Russia. And they are all Russian. That's why they, they're so obsessed of stealing cultural artifacts. When the Soviets destroyed the St. Michael's cathedral in uh, Kiev, so-called Golden Dome Cathedral. What they did as the first, they have stolen mosaics. They have stolen the mosaics from the Byzantine time and brought them to Moscow. Uh, the same they, they do everywhere. They just took it and bring to, to Moscow and then explain it, declare it as Russian. And what is interesting, the so-called good Russians, the liberal Russians, the Russians who oppose Putin, do the same. We have now, in these days, in France, a film exhibition uh, celebrating, or not celebrating, like honoring the memory of Alexei Navalny, who was a brave person, who was an opponent of Putin, who was brutally tortured and murdered, yes, and that is terrible and illegal, but who was Russian, I'm not saying imperialist, but a person who wanted to see Russia great and other countries around as brotherly nations, if not subjugated, and at least slightly guarded by Russia and guided by Russia. So what they do? They took the most important Ukrainian movie from the 70s, The Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, created in, taught in not even in Ukrainian language, in a Carpathian dialect of Ukrainian language, which not every Ukrainian understands, created by a Georgian-born Armenian director who identified himself partly as Ukrainian, who lived in Ukraine, who was arrested by the Soviets for Ukrainian nationalism, and finally died because of the oppression and everything. And his film was banned because of Ukrainian nationalism. So what do the good Russians do now, these Navalny Russians? They take this movie, which is the quintessence of it's an amazing movie. If someone hasn't seen it, I recommend it. It's an amazing movie. Uh, they take it, they translate it into Russian. And they present it as a Russian culture which opposes Putin. No, it's not Russian culture. It's Ukrainian culture, if you want. It's Armenian, Georgian, Ukrainian culture. It was opposing Russia. And Parajanov, who was uh, the, the director of this movie, who was arrested by the Soviets for Ukrainian nationalism and was humiliated, he was never been a Russian. And this movie, you, you have stolen this movie for your purpose and you have appropriated it in the worst colonialist manner. And you try to fool the West and it is the sign of that fact that you are the same imperialists as Putin.
Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's that centerpiece of theft, appropriation, which comes from a position of envy. And this is interesting where you have, um, you know, geopolitical schools of thought. You have people trying to look at it in terms of these big geopolitical rational ideas. But I think the idea of envy, theft, uh, violence, these are much better explainers of what's going on power, control, coercion, these are far more sort of primitive um, attributes of the state. And you have to go back, I think, way before, not just, you know, Middle Ages, you have to go back far further to something far more um, atavistic based on the figure of the Tsar, who is the ultimate, not just the ultimate power, but the ultimate owner of everything. Absolutely. The Nikolai II, the Russia, last Russian emperor, um, when uh, they organized some census in, in Russia, and one of the questions was, uh, like, what is your job? And the question was asked the Tsar himself and said, like, I am a owner of Russian land. So he was like the owner. And but what is uh, really interesting in the, from, this, from this perspective, how uh, Russia tries to appropriate everything, including food, including music. When you look at Russian official uh, concerts, uh, militarist propaganda concerts, it's not the single case. They took, for every of these concerts since years, they took Ukrainian music, the music from Maidan, the music of military, military songs. They just write Russian songs, uh, Russian letters, uh, Russian, Russian text, sorry. But they use the songs like uh, a Plive Kacha, an amazing uh, song honoring fallen Ukrainian soldiers. It was appropriated by that. And it's not only Putin, once again, if you see, after Alexei Navalny was brutally killed by Putin, uh, the, the most important Russian liberal, allegedly, a TV channel, TV Rain, TV Dost, uh, posted a banner with Navalny's uh, photo and with the slogan, heroes never die. But heroes never die is a slogan, heroi never marai, is the slogan which is being used by the Ukrainians from the time of Maidan when the first Ukrainian uh, patriot and Armenian ethnically, Sergei Nigoyan, was killed by a sniper on Maidan. And that slogan, the heroes never die, accompanies almost every remembering um, event of the fallen Ukrainian soldiers. So they just took the slogan and they claim it, it's their own. Uh, and they, they, they sell it to the West. When you look at the Russian, the Russians have created the whole propaganda pages. Like, they had like all these English-speaking pages, not only Russia Today, but a lot of them. And they just posted the uh, allegedly uh, innocent things like, uh, 10 dishes you need to taste in Russia. And then like, when you go through that, you say, okay, uh, there is no Russian dish there. It's the Ukrainian borscht, or Georgian um, hinkali, or Tatar's manti, or a Bashkiran Tatar chak chak sweet, etc. But they say, look, we have that rich culture. Everything what is good is Russia. The, the nations should be happy that we have occupied them. And now we come to a very interesting moment, because I love very much um, a German uh, Kazakh uh, professor and sociologist and historian, uh, Bota Koska Sambekova, uh, who teaches, I think, in the uh, University of Basel at Bern, I'm not sure here. And she wrote a lot of articles on Russian colonialism, how it works. And they say the West doesn't see Russian colonialism because we know the British colonialism. We know like the German colonial, okay, we, we tried to hide it. We never speak about like uh, Namibia and stuff, but we had it like overseas colonialism. And the idea was you come to the country, you establish a rule, you use resources, including manpower, and you separate from the locals. You don't want to be identified with them. You want to be uh, like a supervisor, a lord there. And that is the colonialism, you know, like first people of different skin color or different appearance, and you separate from them, but you exploit them. The Russians do it opposite. They occupy the country, they eradicate the elites, they eradicate writers, uh, they eradicate sometimes religion, and they want to integrate the rest, erase the nation, erase the language, erase the culture, rename the cities. They always rename the cities. They destroy cemeteries, they destroy like uh, churches, mosques, and then they claim the land as their own. Like you have never lived here. That's why it's hard for, for, for the West to understand Russian colonialism. You say, yeah, it's not colonialism because Russians marry Tatars, Russians are like live there, Russians uh, eat their food, etc. 
Oh, there are no Tatars as a nation, like it's a part of Russian nation. No, it's a nation which has been colonized, partly destroyed, partly eliminated, and then uh, the Russians try to integrate them. With Tatars and Bashkirs, the bigger nations, they're not as successful as much, but some nations like Erzia or Moksha or, or, or others, Akomi, uh, they are almost not existent anymore. And that is how Russian colonialism works. And it's extraordinary, isn't it? Because I remember my time in um, the 90s where there is a certain amount of, I'd call it, sentimentality, not placing Ukrainian culture, humor, etc., on the same level as Russian, but on a folk level, you can have a certain amount of sentimentality towards it. You can look at it as a, as a sort of little, little brotherly nation, etc. That changes, though, doesn't it? As long as those people are subservient and acquiescent, you can, you can have fond feelings for them as long as it's kind of measured and limited. The minute they try to take their culture back, take their resources back and resist that, we flip into they're all Nazis mode. And this is where Ukraine is at the moment, regaining its agency, regaining its history. Um, that is a process you get the impression of when you speak to any Ukrainian and the personal journeys they've been on uh, whether it be perhaps sort of, you know, starting to use the Russian language less and use Ukrainian more, discovering Ukrainian literature for the first time, discovering their family history, you get the sense of Maidan being a, a spark of political awareness, but it goes in parallel with the rediscovery of language, culture, history, and so on. How threatening is that process to Russia? It's absolutely, it's a death sentence to Russian imperialism. And I agree that for many Ukrainians, uh, even 10 years ago, or five years ago, it wasn't obvious for many of them, not for all, but for many. And I personally know people who serve in the Ukrainian army and came as volunteers, who said to me, look, I, I volunteered like in early 22, but before that, I didn't understand what is the difference. Okay, we can use Russian language, we can consume Russian uh, culture products like movies, uh, TV series, uh, books, etc. What is the difference? And now they say, I understand how it works. Because first the Russians, like, they, they substitute your product with the Russian one, and then they start to sell you the Russian narratives. And then the Ukrainian writers from Ukraine have no chance to publish their books because there is no market for it, because market has been consumed by the, the, the Russian publishing analysis, and it comes step to step. And sometimes in one movie, you have like the only bad person who is Ukrainian. It's nothing against Ukrainians, but it happens that the only negative person in the movie is a Ukrainian. And in another one, like there are saints about like Russian history, military history in Odessa or Kherson, and it is the only thing which is being put on the front of that movie. And that like, that is the level of intoxication. And, uh, of course, uh, not every Ukrainian saw that because you need to have a special, you need to have education, you need to study, you need to have time, you need to have a privilege of thinking about it. But now it's very obvious because the Russians came to Ukraine with their body armors where it was written, speak Russian or die. And that's a pretty straight into your face sentence. So... Having seen this take place, and I think there's a huge, and we're going to talk about disinformation later, there's a huge gap between the reality, the most documented war in history, the most documented genocidal behavior, perhaps in history as well, and Western policymakers who are, in my view, not fully talking about and recognizing that depth of disgusting behavior and the full depth of the aggression and where it might lead. We are still limiting it to, well, they've done this and this, but that's okay, that's it. Let's just bring a sort of stasis into this situation. They're not thinking forward into, well, what next? What are they prepared to do? How far will this go? My view is Putin will do almost anything, not just to win, but to survive. You know, like, I, always, I already quoted Lenin in this talk. I now want to quote Marx, which is not very typical for me. And uh, Karl Marx um, wrote a lot of articles on the Crimean War in 1850s. And on the other quotes, which I love from Marx, he says that the Russian bear is capable for everything as long as he knows that other nations are capable of nothing. And in this sentence, I'm a Marxist. Because that is exactly what we see in Russian behavior since 
decades. And that's what, what, what Putin is doing. Like, of course, they want to sell narratives that Bucha was an excess, and it was like, it were not even Russians, it were Burats. Like all the Burats of Dagestani, not the Russians. Or like that it will never, uh, like Mariupol never happened. We rebuilt it, we reconstruct. Look what beautiful is now the car station in Mariupol. They have stolen pictures of some German car station, like bus station, and posted it as new Mariupol bus station. Uh, that's what they do. And of course, there are many people in Germany who say, yeah, because like Russians cannot be that bad because it is we Germans who were bad and no other nations can be that bad. But look, the, the banality of evil is, as Hannah Oren said, that actually everyone is capable for evil as long as it is being encouraged. And the Russian um, cultural, political, so social narrative encourage people extensively to do evil things. And that's why it's not enough to just change Putin for anyone who's good. Putin was actually very good in his speeches. In the first years, he spoke for press freedom, elections, free elections, cooperation with the West, and, and, and. But was it what he really thought about? I don't believe so. That's why it's important to completely reorganize the Russian society or Deter it if we don't want to intervene. Deter it with all means. Because just saying, okay, Putin will go and another one come, who will come? Medvedev. We have seen what he tweets. He's not a guy with an iPhone and deep purple music. He's a genocidal psychopath. And that is what the Russian system demands from the people to keep this country as a one piece. Well, we see what we want to see, and in 2001 it suited us to see Russia as an ally because of the war on terror, because of our own wishful thinking. But already in 2001, 2003, it was quite clear that Putin was dismantling the independent media, uh, piece by piece, uh, using one oligarch against another, one neck against another, and, you know, it's the same salami slicing, divide and conquer tactics. They are already fully in evidence at the time. Not many voices pointing it out, but that was already happening there. So they controlled the narrative. They controlled how we were reacting to Russia and hiding their intentions. They're not hiding their intentions now, but they are still seeking to coerce and control our actions. Let's look at some of the areas where Russian narratives, Russian manipulation is preventing the supply of weapons and finance. Let's tackle in particular the F-16s, which never seem to arrive. The attackums, long range attackums, which are crucial. We've talked about Taurus already, but there's also the issue of Russian central bank assets. And I know you touched on this earlier, but they're still seeding narratives that if you take those funds, you will destroy your credibility as a financial system. You'll do this, you'll do that. This coming from a state that is already confiscating foreign assets, has already put a legislation in place that will allow them to confiscate the assets of their own citizens. Uh, essentially, there's, there was no rule of law, but now that lawlessness is enshrined in law, if that makes sense. Well, um, I agree. Um, and what we um, witnesses to during the Putin's um, development and his evolution as a dictator, of course, the West ignored it. Uh, and here in Germany, I can s say about uh, Germany, we have seen the case of uh, like anti-Americanism, which played a huge role. Like, look what the Americans did in Iraq. It's much worse than the Russians did in Chechnya. Look at the free media, Snowden, Assange. Like, blame the U.S. Russians are good people. And uh, the Russians use it, of course. But regarding the wellness, we still have, I think I need to wrap it up, uh, we still have a lot of people in Germany on the politician level who made their career preaching understanding of Russia and anti-Americanism and anti-NATO and anti-capitalism. It's actually weird that they see Putin as a champion of anti-capitalistic force, the uh, arch-capitalistic leader. And they need to preach to their core and to, 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 to continue to evolve. And they don't want to get, uh, to get wiped out of the uh, historical books as losers. They want to say after Ukraine is consumed by Russia, look, we were right, Russia has reached its borders and we don't care about Ukraine. That is the hugest danger, the biggest danger.
Well, we're going to have to wrap this uh, panel up. Um, deeply fascinating topics. We're going to carry on talking about propaganda and its effect on coercing and controlling our actions in a later panel. Do please submit questions. Look at the topics coming up in the panel. Please submit your questions ahead of time. We would love to be able to call those out and use those as the basis of our discussion later. Do get involved and thank you for staying with us.